Hi, I'm Ed Perlmutter, Congressman for Colorado's 7th Congressional District. I'm here today with Linda Bowman, President of the Community College of Aurora, to introduce a collaborative project which preserves the experiences of Colorado's veterans. With the help of students and faculty from the Community College of Aurora, cooperation from Congressman Perlmutter's office, and the U.S. Library of Congress Veterans History Project, we are presenting a film that accurately portrays the living history of veterans whose wartime experiences will be permanently preserved for future generations. This living legacy will forever be a tribute to the men and women who selflessly and proudly served this nation in time of war. Their histories will be preserved in a place of honor at the Library of Congress so future generations can truly understand and reflect upon the individual bravery and sacrifice of these courageous men and women. Now, please join us on this remarkable journey into history. It looked like the wrath of God had been descended upon it. It was just rough territory. Saw a lot of men die. I saw a lot of them dead. Bullets started coming in. The man on my left took a slug under his arm. The man on my right was the patrol leader, and he had taken five or six slugs in the gut. You would hear the choppers coming in, and they would come in one after another. After they offloaded, bringing in the wounded, they placed a tag on the toe of the, the wounded, and it would say, unknown. There was always a discussion about uh, having MIGs and, and uh, anti-aircraft and also missiles coming at us. Well, I was born on a farm where Leoma Route 3 crossed Turkey Creek in Lawrence County, Tennessee. There wasn't too much there in Glendive. We, my dad worked for the railroad, and my mother made all the bread, cookies, and whatever else she wanted. Plain old meat, potatoes, and gravy family. My mother was a single parent, and I recall uh, there were three families living in three rooms. I grew up in an era where we were very patriotic. Uh, World War II was just ending. Uh, we were still in that patriotic mode, so to speak. I was uh, 17 and I was, went to sign up and I didn't weigh enough. And the chief up there says, well, says, you go home, young man, and come back in about 30 days. Before you come back, eat all the bananas you can and drink all the water you can. So I did, and I barely went by 126 pounds. I finished nursing. I worked for two weeks. There were seven nurses who said they were interested in joining the military. I wasn't able to go, and I said, bring an application for me. The application happened to be Army. As it would happen, only three of us went on to raise our right hand in New York, and we were sworn in as second lieutenants. Going through Colorado State, which is a land-grant college, uh, we were all required to take uh, ROTC for the first two years. At that time, they were starting up what they call civilian pilot training. I did learn how to fly and get my license. I didn't voluntarily join the Army, I was drafted. I actually, I was 21 years old when Vietnam became part of my life. But what we don't remember about Vietnam is the first two years of Vietnam, it was the draft. At 18 years old, you had to go down to the Selective Service and register with the draft. I was part of that. That's the reason I received that notice in April 4th, 1966. When 
I first went in the Navy, I wore, wore size four shoe. And this sailor up there, he says, well, what size of shoe do you wear? I says, four. And he says, well, we don't have baby shoes. Basic training was very difficult because immediately they let you know that you were going to be training to go to a situation like Vietnam, uh, which uh, had the probability of either becoming wounded or dead. Um, so we took serious training. They, the drill instructors were very adamant about making sure you were physically conditioned. We had one month of uh, basic training at Fort Meade, Maryland. We learned how to disarm an M14. We learned how to throw a grenade. And we were told this was necessary in case we had a patient who was brought in and he had the weapons. Then I went to Farragut, Idaho, boot camp at Coeur d'Alene. Uh, yeah, and I was a uh, studied minor surgery, first aid, chemical warfare. I took an active part because I became an acting sergeant while I was in basic training and uh, immediately took things to heart at 13 weeks of hard basic training, uh, the basic fundamentals of combat. And soon after that, came back home for a couple of days' stay and immediately went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for 13 more weeks of intense advanced infantry training. And at that time, uh, it became uh, more intense and more anxious about uh, uh, knowing that I was going to be going to Vietnam. I was, of course, uh, finally transferred to uh, Tuskegee. And in getting down there, it was obvious that the program that they had set up was not meant to uh, supplement uh, the armed forces. There were three blacks in my class, and the rest were white. I remember one thing in particular about the officer candidate school. In my part of the South, the Q Klux Klan was still operating. And there was a very low regard for Negroes. I got out of the Air Force, and the reason why I got out was the fact that I didn't want to participate in a segregated kind of unit. When I finished my month of training, I was really proud of my uniform, and I wanted to buy heels. And every store I went to in Silver Springs would tell me, we don't have what you want, or you can't come in, but if you walk further down the street, you might find a store that will sell you what you want. I grew up in it and didn't know any better. But in the barracks, we were assigned bunks according to, uh, alphabetically, and on one side of me was Jenkins, and on the other side was Johnson, two Negroes. And from them I learned tolerance. Now tolerance is wrong. Equality, acceptance. They were as fine a people as I ever met, and it is literally changed my life. Two, I've explained that it was uh, just almost a one-on-one. -on -one. There were no, there were no mass movements of troops and maneuver and all of the things that that uh, you think of as warfare. But uh, in Korea, there was uh, army against army. Oh, I think I might have saw a thousand or so like that killed. Had a hard time, but I got used to it, I guess. We'd, if we give them morphine, you'd have to put an M in red on their forehead so no one would come back and give them some more. We, we were in the Battle of Peleliu. And the, um, the islands, the hills, are just honeycombed with caves. And the uh, Japanese used that as their 
uh, defense, the caves, they would stay in the caves, safe from artillery blast and all this. And if anybody moved within rifle shot, they shot, and you, you, there was, you didn't know where the shot came from. It was probably the worst terrain for battle that has ever been. I was a corpsman with them. And we was in a foxhole, not a foxhole, a shell hole, a uh, big one. And, and this uh, sergeant or gunny sergeant, he says, now, Doc, whatever you do, if you hear them <coughs> holler, corpsman, don't get up and go looking for who's hollering because they're Japanese. Sure as the world, here they come at night. Carmen, Carmen. Uh, in Vietnam, of the 58,000 men that, that were killed, uh, 38,000 were killed in the first four years of that war. So this is like about three weeks or a month into the uh, arrival in Vietnam, and immediately I'm put on a mountaintop. There's six of us. Artillery unit just just left. We snuck in so we would be undetected, and them moving out and us moving in. Uh, immediately we were placed on top of the mountain and waiting for any scavengers to pick up empty shells or casings or boxes. And immediately, within 15 minutes after that last plane leaving, we were hit. Bullets started coming in. The man on my left took a slug under his arm. And blew his heart out. The man on my right was the patrol leader and he had taken five or six slugs in the gut. And the man The man in front of me was wounded immediately also. There were left us three. The two on the sides uh, were fairly new. They had just come in the country myself, and now it was my welcoming to Vietnam. Knowing that we were surrounded, how I didn't get hit was a miracle. Bullets were coming in pretty good. Wow. <laughs> there a lot of gunfire, a lot of hollering. I was screaming. I was crying. Oh, God. I don't think I can, I don't think I can finish it. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to have a hard time sleeping tonight, even now. I had nightmares for years. I've talked more to you now than I ever talked to my wife. May the 11th, 1944, 0930, when that happened. I'll never forget him. No, that, that was the last time. I can tell you the story, second by second, of what happened on April 23rd at 6.30 in the morning. It never leaves you.
Once we were hit, there was just a tremendous amount of small arms fire that came in and we were trying to detect. Everybody was hit immediately. I took a bullet between the fingers, threw my hand down. The next thing I know, I had a second one, an AK-47, went through the shoulder and flipped me around. Then there was a considerable explosion right there. I could feel this grenade shrapnel hit me in the shoulder and just everywhere. I had those bits of metal hit my face, but there was a big piece that stuck in my shoulder and I pulled it out because it was burning so much. And I was laying flat down and then 45 slug hit me from the leg and flipped me around again. Communications went on and I told Captain James that I couldn't see the compass anymore. I couldn't give direction because I blew too much blood coming out of me and I was in a state of shock, I think. John and Doug were a little bit farther away and we continued to fight back and forth. By that time, communication was that they couldn't get a QRF in because it was just surrounded, heavily surrounded, I think, was his word I couldn't remember. Next thing I know, they said they couldn't hit the QRF, but the chopper pilot was coming in, Jim Bracewall. We were about 500 yards from the top of the hill. It's offset of the top of the mountain. Chopper couldn't come in and land because we had tree stumps that were preventing it from landing. Chopper pulled up at the top there and gunners jumped out, but actually Doug and John were carrying David and Bill up the hill and I decided I didn't want to stay there. <laughs> so I had my car 15 using it as a crutch and I was walking up the side of the mountain. I got to the top there and they were throwing bodies on top of the chopper because the chopper was about three or four feet above the ground and they were stacking us like bags of potatoes. And I remember when the chopper finally took off, that the gunners opened up to make sure that there was nothing around us as we were coming, they were leaving. And I thought we were being attacked again. And when the chopper made its turn like that, you could just feel the blood just running underneath all of us. It was just that much blood. There's two or three of us, it was. Trying to get back to the ship, but finally made it. And that's when the German Luftwaffe would come by and they were firing at us and we were firing at them. And I got got hit. And And then we got back to the ship. The captain says, when we get back up to Boston, we'll recommend you for the Purple Heart. I never thought of myself as being courageous, but self-sustaining. That's the part of uh, the, the animalistic instinct that comes out of you when you're put in a barbaric situation like war it isn't um, uh, you, you don't you're not the same civilized mind that you're once taught to be two years ago went to the Ranger Reunion in Louisville, Kentucky. The pilot, he knew me. I didn't know him right away. And I says, tell me about it. He says, I have no idea how you're even here. He says, when I saw you walking up the hill, every time you took a deep breath, this wound here, the blood would just squirt out and you were red from here down. But he says, you came up that hill, they were stacking the bodies on top of the chopper and you had this shit-eating grin on your face. <laughs> had a lot of fun in the Navy. Our ship uh, had another assignment. They couldn't wait another assignment. So we happily spent, <laughs> spent about a month uh, on this nice Pacific island. 
waiting for a ship to take us down to the Palau Islands. Had it not been for the success of the Tuskegee Airmen, as we made it through and demonstrated that we could do those kinds of things that are related to uh, flying an aircraft, and also that we could uh, uh, save a few people's lives because we did uh, fly missions that uh, uh, finally got uh, sufficient uh, assignments to escort bombers, that we didn't lose a bomber going over there. There was one that had come around the starboard side, I mean port side, we were firing at them, they were firing at us. And, and it, we hit it and it went along the starboard side and we could see the pilot in there. And he, the plane was on fire. And as he went by, we waved at him. And uh, he crashed in the water about 200 yards. Thank you.